CPSC 526. This is lecture 18 on the topic of code injection attacks. So code injection attacks are the third major type of web uh, security vulnerability that we'll be talking about in the last one. So the idea of uh, the code injection attack is that a malicious client who is using a server-side web application is able to get code to run in the server. So the previous attacks that we talked about, cross-site request forgery, we were able to get clients to issue HTTP requests that they didn't want to issue and possibly have side effects. Um, and cross-site scripting, where code was reflected back the client was able to, or an evil website was able to get the client to receive code from a server and run it under the auspices of that server instead of as the victim code. Here, we are now talking about a client who is providing input to a web server, and that input is attempting to be code to get the web server to run. So in this case, now we only have two actors. We have a good website and a malicious client of that website. So in this case, we're talking about the code that's running behind the scenes on web servers. So behind the scenes, there's going to be programs that are storing user data, accessing user data, databases that are storing lots of data, code that dynamically generates the website based on the client, based on the data stored in databases, and so forth. And as well, there's going to be side effects. When a user interacts with the website when they make purchases, for example, uh, on a shopping site, something then gets delivered to their actual address. So there's side effects, and as a result of these side effects, data is stored, functions are called, data gets processed, and so forth. And then the web server will receive the user input, run whatever programs are necessary to prepare their, their output, and then dynamically generate HTML for the client to see and load content from different sources, access databases, and such. So the problem is that on the server side, if it's running scripting languages, scripting languages allow strings to be executed. So for example, we have this, this notion of code and data, again, being separate things, but actually the line between them is quite blurred. And, and frequently it's the case that code can be data and data can be code. And code injection attacks is an example of users providing what the server expects to be data, but instead gets interpreted as code and run as code. Then the distinction between code and data is not so clear cut as one might think. And of course, this is not just a problem with scripting languages. Buffer overflow attacks are an example of the same kind of a thing, where you s provide a string that overfills a buffer, and then what ends up going after it becomes interpreted as a pointer to a return address, and then that gets ended up being executed. And it could be a string input, then gets interpreted as machine code and run. And as well, C has a system call. So system call takes a string and executes that string as though it were a command prompt running some command. Well, this is an example of now data being interpreted as code. But scripting languages, it's a particularly hard problem because they're designed to allow such, a, such things to exist. They're allowed to take a string and because of the nature of a scripting language, it can immediately interpret that string without needing to compile it or anything like that. It can take the string and simply run it. And scripting languages make this trivial to do and, and useful, and a lot, of, a lot of scripting languages will have legit, legitimate uses for these sorts of um, automatic execution of data as code. However, if you have a web server that actually does this, you open yourself to an enormous risk because now you have an attacker who could provide code as data and you will just run it. So we'll see a bunch of examples of this. So we're going to look at different languages here. We'll look at PHP and later SQL. 
Uh, you don't need to know how to program in these languages or even to have seen them before. Hopefully you can look at it and sort of figure out the syntax and figure out what's going, what, what it sort of looks like. I don't expect you to actually be able to program in these languages, but at least be able to look at it and, and have a feel for what's actually being represented with this pseudocode or with this a snippet of code. So PHP is a uh, hypertext preprocessor. It's a server-side scripting languages. It has C-like syntax, and it's intermixed with HTML. And basically, you create web pages by including a bunch of PHP directives in the HTML. And when the HTML is being prepared for the user, those PHP directives are then executed. So here we have a PHP tag which echoes the string my value. So whatever the string my value is, or the, the, the variable my value, what its value is gets put into that PHP block inside the input value equals. So the, what it'll end up doing is input value equals that angle bracket that contains the question mark PHP block, that gets replaced with the code, the result of running the code echo dollar sign my value semicolon, which is going to be in effect printing out the value of my value. And PHP allows you to embed variables within strings. So you can say, you can say, for instance, if you set the value of the variable user to be world, you can just echo hello dollar sign user, and that'll actually echo hello world. Or you can concatenate strings with the, the dot marker like that. So imagine, if you will, a server-side PHP calculator that works like this. So the user provides some input value, and this goes into the variable in. And then... When you want to actually evaluate the line below, you end up with the situation where you take the string operator one is equal to whatever the user provided input is semicolon. So it's just constructing a line. You can imagine the input, the calculator has two different text boxes and a choice of operators like plus, minus, and so forth. And what this code is doing is it's taking the user provided value, which it assumes is a number like three, and just running the code operator one equals three, operator two equals five, and then it executes the operate whatever is in operator one and operator two combined with the operation like add or subtract or what have you. Now, this is a very simple to use calculator, of course, because now you can just take whatever the user provides and construct this, the code that you want to run, which is operator one equals that value. And it will work when, for instance, the website is receiving normal calls from the user. So for instance, the user types in the number five and clicks submit, and it runs calc.php question value equals five, and then it can run this code and it would execute eval dollar sign op equals five. Now, the problem is that if you rely only on client-side checking that, for instance, the field val contains a number, and you've checked this with JavaScript, and if it passes, then you allow the submit button to be clicked, it could still be the case that the attacker exhibits arbitrary behavior. And the arbitrary behavior in this case could be to provide another value. It doesn't need to run the JavaScript that checks that form. It doesn't even need to use a web browser. It can issue HTTP gets right from the command line. And it can therefore put whatever it wants into that field. So for instance, it could provide value equals five semicolon system brackets rm dash rf slash. So in this case, this would now delete the entire file system, and it would delete recursively the root of the file system and, and force it to occur. Uh, in effect, answer yes to any prompts that would otherwise have appeared. So what happens now is that the adversary is able to shell out to the system, run a, sh a shell command, because PHP allows for this, and the reason it's going to happen is because they decided to implement the calculator by taking whatever the string the user provided and evaluating it as code, right? It was an, under the assumption that they just provided a number and they were evaluating that number. But of course, if they were to provide any other code, that code would just get evaluated alongside. So the PHP would execute whatever is provided in that string. In this case, it's a semicolon which ends the value equals five component, and then further commands of the adversary's choosing. 
and this yeah would delete the file system, which is not presumably what the developers of this calculator would have wanted. Another example, you have, suppose, a PHP server-side code for sending an email. So you enter your email somehow, and you click register to a mailing list or what have you, and then some PHP code runs. And you could imagine if it was implemented as follows, they say dollar sign email equals get the email address somehow from the arguments of the from the client, and then run the command, it's the system command, so shell out to the system and say basically mail to the email address and pipe in slash temp slash default email body. So what does this implementation mean? What's what's happening here? The idea is there might be some email that the server wants to send. So every time you click submit, you get sent this email. It stores this email in slash temp slash default email body. And the code that's being run is to just basically say mail to this email address this 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 email, this text file that contains the email that I want to send. So it's a simple, straightforward, easy to implement way of actually sending mail. So this would this would work in practice using the, the Unix's mail command. So a normal call might be that the, the victim.com website send invite PHP and you pass in email equals decent at person.com. So some decent person uh, sends uh, types in their email address. The email address is correctly formatted. Then what ends up happening is the system call would say mail to decent at person.com and then redirect in slash temp slash default email body and they would get the email as and everything would work as intended. Now suppose an adversary knew that the PHP code was implemented this way. Suppose that they knew that this is what the code looked like. And there's many ways they could have figured this out. Uh, for instance, they could have helped even write the code if they wanted. They could uh, be aware of it because it's open source. Or they could just try different things and figure it out this way. In this case, now an adversarial call could send their, as their email, they could provide their email address as the following evil at person.com, redirect slash user slash password, semicolon, cat. So what is this happening? What, why are they doing this? Well, in this case, now what ends up getting evaluated is that the email address will still be the same. So they will still run the code mail to evil at person.com. However, the email address in that command still continues. And since they're just concatenating strings together without any concept of data versus code, what ends up happening is that the control characters, the redirect, will still be concatenated as follows, but instead of redirecting the default email body, instead they're de redirecting the password file. So now they're mailing to themselves the password file. And then they end the command with a semicolon. The start of the next command, cat, is used to sort of clean up the operation. That way, now, whatever's left over at the end of the system call will just get ignored because of the cat command. So in this case, by providing a control character as part of their email address and not, in a sense, giving a real email address, they're able to select the file that they get sent off the entire file system, as opposed to just the one that would be otherwise have sent. So these are examples of input validation vulnerabilities. Basically, the server was expecting data of a certain format, and that was violated. The server was expecting, for instance, a string that belongs to a username that is somewhere in the database, or the server was expecting an email address in a particular format, or the server was expecting a number. And in all these cases, if code is, is sent as part of the data, and then because of just combining strings and using functions of part of the programming language, like eval, you end up executing that you end up executing that code, you have now allowing the adversary to provide code that your server will execute. And this is outside of the specification of what the server should have been doing in the first place. These, it'll start executing code that it otherwise normally wouldn't be even executing. So for instance, we might have an assumption that the string does not have control characters, that the string does not have string termination characters or begin other statements of code. And of course, the solution is simple. You simply cannot trust any input. So whenever you're receiving input from a user, design principles tell us you full mediation, meaning 
all assumptions must be validated. All input from users must be treated as hostile, must be treated as potential attack traffic until it is otherwise validated that it is not. So every single piece of user input that has an assumption about it must be checked. If a number must be positive, it must be checked. There's been examples of web servers that, for instance, allowed you to specify negative items to buy. So you wanted to purchase negative amounts of some item, and then the resulting mathematics would have your bill come up as a small amount. For instance, if you bought something expensive and negative 10 of something small, you'd end up paying very little for the expensive item. If a string, if a number should fit in a string, then that must be checked. If there's length requirements, it must be checked. If there's any aspect of input that can be that is being assumed, these assumptions must be checked if that is coming from the user. So all input over the network must be regarded as hostile when you're implementing such a web server. So perhaps the most famous class of code injection vulnerabilities are called SQL injection attacks, SQL code injection. This is because many databases use SQL and there's many examples of SQL being used in, the, in a context of code execution that does potentially harmful things. So SQL is a widely used database query language. It allows you to fetch data from databases with the select. So select everything from some table where some condition holds. So select all you select everything from the user's table where the name of the user is some particular username that the user has provided. It also allows you to add data, so insert into this table, into these columns, these values, modify data, delete data. It's a, a generalized, um, standardized interface to interact with the database. Now, a database can be implemented in different ways, can be stored in different ways. However, SQL is an interface to it. It's an API to access that data. And as such, the different databases can all support SQL because SQL itself is simply a language that you use to interact with databases. And suppose that we were to generate a query as such. So when we're generating queries from user input, we have to assemble the query including values from the user. So the user, untrusted input, provides some values, and then we build a query based on those values, and then we execute the query. So this would be typical query generation code. Here we have the, we create a variable selected user is based on user input. So the user provides their username or something. And then we build the query, select username comma key from keys where username equals selected user. So this is just retrieving some value from the database and then we run it. So on the, on the database, we execute the query that we've constructed. So this is going to be just fine when the username does not result, does not end up terminating that string. You see that the username is in single quotes, the selected user, username equals open single quotes, dollar sign selected user, end single quote. If selected user includes a single quote and we're naively doing string concatenation, then the first appearance of that single quote would be sufficient to exit the username and everything after it is no longer going to be interpreted as a username. It's going to be interpreted as part of the select query. It's going to be interpreted as code if the user provides a string that is able to terminate the username string. Whatever is left over after that will then be interpreted as code. So if user is a malicious string, it can change the meaning of the query. It can actually change the behavior. It can change what it does. It can change what the, the actual query, which was supposed to simply do a lookup on a particular table, it can make it do whatever the attacker wants. So imagine here you have this login prompt, you type in login, you type in your username, you type in your password, the browser sends the user, the web server creates the SQL, and the database executes that SQL. So suppose instead if you were to maliciously log in and you entered as your username a string that was actually terminated the what would be interpreted as the string and then provided new code. So as an example of a classic SQL injection attack, the provided input instead of being the uh, username, 
is a username foo followed by a single quote which ends the username, a semicolon which ends the command, and then a brand new command which actually deletes the table of users, drop table users. And then that command is ended with a semicolon, and then the double dash is for a comment. So this is a way of just tidying up things to make it not crash, to make it so that the code still will execute uh, correctly. The hyphen hyphen means whatever was after this part of the string is now a comment, you can just ignore it. The result is that the executed query becomes select username and keys from the keys table where username is equal to foo. Okay, well this does this does the select, so it's the same at this point as having typed foo as the username. However, additionally, drop table users is then done, which deletes all of the information from the users table, which is presumably not what was intended by the database designers. Another example, you could imagine authentication to a database being done where you do a database lookup for the user and the password and you check to see if you found any entries. So somehow from the user you get their username, you get their password, uh, hopefully you would further implement this with proper best practices for hashing and salting the passwords. but Suppose you did that and now you have your password and the result is the database is simply doing a search. It's doing select all from the users table where the username exactly matches what the user provided from the form for the user field and the password exactly matches what the user provided on the form for the password field. And then the authentication is simply a check about the size. So a user is found if this search yields a result. That is, if there is, in fact, a username who, whose pa corresponding password both match what the user provided, right? This is, in a sense, what an authentication, password-based authentication would look like in some form. This is simply being implemented in SQL. Now, if, there's a, if there is a result, that means that there is some row in this users table where username and password match. So if there is a result, return success. So how could we attack this? How could we attack this particular one? Well, in this case, we could give as our username uh, a ter string termination and then change the logic of the query so that it just matches more results. So before we were saying select everything from the users where the username matches and the password matches. Here now what we are saying is select everything from the users table where the username is empty or one equals one comment out the rest of the line. So the, the password fields and the other things no longer matter. So this will always return results. Select star from users where true or some other condition. Well, if you have true or, then you're, the result of that is true, which means that now it will always match on every user. So... This will return results. So everything's now matched, the user is therefore found, and the authentication is successful because the idea of authentication in the setting was contingent on whether or not there was a result from executing this query. Here we have another example of the same sort of idea. So now, when the user is presented with a prompt for their name or their password, they can provide the string end quote or where password like begin quote uh, percent sign. Now, in the SQL language, the percent sign is like an asterisk. It's a wild card. It just matches anything. So it's, it's like saying um, the password is like any possible string. So this will always be true. And so the server would then receive a query where they're given the string select star where the user is empty or where the password is anything and the password is empty or the password is anything. And in this case, the password like anything, the user like anything would allow the matching would be true each time. So the result of the logic would break down to it being true and true and therefore it would match everything. So all results would then be returned. Now, one interesting thing about both these examples is if they're being used for authentication is not only could it be the case that the presence of returned records indicates a successful authentication, but further, it is 
likely to match the first record in the database, meaning that if the results are then used, if the first entry of the results is then used, so first you check if the results is empty, and if the results are not empty, you take the first element in this array, and that becomes the user that you log into, then it's likely going to result in you logging into the database with the credentials of the first person listed in the users table. And in many situations, the first person listed in this entries of the users table is going to be the administrator. So this is also an example of a privilege escalation attack because not only are you able to fake authentication without providing any credentials, but you can further escalate your authentication to the level of being an administrator of the database, which is likely allowing you to have a lot more capabilities than you otherwise would have had. There's lots of other things you can do with SQL attacks, with SQL injection attacks. So, for instance, you can pull data in from other databases. So you can imagine the username is simply end quote and a false statement like one equals two. So this results in nothing being returned but then you union it with the results of an entirely different SQL query. So you union a blank result set with select card holders, numbers, expiration month, expiration years from credit cards table. So just by setting your username to a particular SQL query that obtains you different results, you can just change the, the, the thing that you're ending up getting when, when the query is returned. And as well, you will have to know what these tables will look like, but typically there's going to be some structure, there's some understanding, some guesswork, or something along those lines. And in the end, we shouldn't rely on the fact that you cannot guess what the table names and what the field names are in a database for security. We want to have better security than this sort of obscurity by these being sort of unguessable strings, because typically as programmers and developers, we're going to use human meaningful strings as opposed to random numbers to identify meaningful things like expiration month and expiration year. You can create users into the database. So this is just chaining on extra commands. So you make your username end quote semicolon. So that just ends the command. And then you just provide a bunch of extra commands. Insert into users new users. So let's say you just wanted to add a new user because you're not eligible to be a user of this website. Well, then you can set uh, the the the... Uh, add a new user. Or in this example, if you wanted to update an existing users, you can change data. So now we have a user who previously had the email address of victim at ucalgary.ca, and an attacker can just say, well, replace wherever you saw this string with that string. And now they can replace their email address with the attacker's email address and thereby receive mail from them perhaps, or be able to receive password update information, things like that. There's also another concept of SQL injection, which is known as second order SQL injection. So again, this is the same general idea. You're providing code instead of data. You're asked for data, you provide code. But let's just say that it's actually properly checked for at the time. Let's say that the interface that you're using actually takes care and does things properly. And you know when you enter in a username that has quotes in it, it converts it into a way that makes it that it doesn't break their database. But the problem is there can be dozens of different ways of interacting with this database that are not just the one web front end that happen to do sanitation or sanitization of the inputs correctly. It may be the case that later you're using it in another context, a more trusted context perhaps, that doesn't perform these sanity checks anymore and then you're able to actually cause more damage. So for instance, you could set your username to admin quote space hyphen hyphen. Now, this has an effect if it's improperly escaped, that's that first quote would end the string. But let's just say that when you do this, it actually does it correctly. And this becomes your full username, admin quote space hyphen hyphen. So now that is your username. And at another point in time, you end up maybe on a, a terminal, on a, an actual computer within an organization, or not just simply not using the web front end, and you try to change your password. And now you can do a password reset of the admin account 
and simply by providing your actual username and doing a password reset. So you're intending, or it appears as though you're doing a password reset of your username, but actually you're doing a password reset of the admin account because in the second case where the password reset is actually occurring, there is not proper escaping of the string, and, and as a result, then the attack occurs. So here, the first step is to position yourself for a later attack, and then the later attack is when, for instance, an admi some other administrator or someone working in the IT support is able to simply run an SQL query resetting your uh, account password, but without realizing or inadvertently actually resetting the admin's password at that point. And this comes down to inconsistencies in interfaces that are some which may check properly and some which may not check properly. So what can we do? Well, in the case of SQL injection, and more broadly speaking, any sort of in code injection attacks, the important thing is that code and data need to be isolated. We need to have a concept that things that are meant to be data can never be interpreted as code. We need to have the ability to validate all inputs, filter out any characters that has special meaning, apostrophes, semicolons, percents, hyphens, underscores. In the case of SQL, different languages will have different things. But of course, what matters is this idea that punctuation can have a specific meaning and we need to make sure that it is never interpreted with that meaning based in code when processing it when it actually should be data. And as we talked about before, Data types must be checked. All assumptions must be checked. If you're assuming something about a string, for instance, that it doesn't contain particular characters, then you need to check that to make sure. There's libraries to do this. There's libraries designed to do this. These libraries should be used instead of doing it yourself because if you miss one, then you're vulnerable to attack. So it's better to use time-tested tools, standard practices, best practices that are already solving this problem than try to develop your own because you might miss one. Um, in general, you want to whitelist permitted characters instead of blacklisting the ones that don't work. You don't want to omit or say that, oh, don't allow usernames with hyphens in it. You want to say only allow usernames with letters in it. That's a better way of ensuring safety. It's a safe default because now you have a well-defined set of safe values and you can match those using regular expressions as opposed to, again, writing your own simple tool to do what has already been solved with regular expressions. So make use of time-tested tools and ensure that all of the input that you receive that from the internet is untrusted and is treated as such. Another thing is the concept of escaping characters. Different languages do this differently, but in general, all sorts of languages have a concept of escape characters because in order to represent important things like new lines, we need to be able to type out a new line. And typically, for instance, in the C world, we use backslash as an escape character, so backslash n means new line. But now, if we actually want to write a backslash, we have to do something else, because a single backslash is going to say, uh, the next character is going to be meaningful. So in order to do a backslash, we need to do backslash, backslash. And in order to do a quote, which might end a string, we have to do backslash quote. And so, the idea here is that there can be names that have quotes in them, and these are legitimate names, and this we must account for them. We must allow users to be able to provide their names, uh, even if it does cause uh, a problem with, with our system. So it would be uh, not supporting the idea of least surprise to forbid someone from being able to enter their name when asked for their name. So in order to do this, we need to escape the control characters or the characters that may be confused with control characters in the input. And again, there's functions to do this. So don't do this on an ad hoc basis where you're just parsing the string and adding backslashes where you think it's appropriate. Because again, the language may be more complicated. There may be a higher level semantics of where these backslashes are needed. And there are functions that exist to provide escaping of strings appropriately. So again, escaping quotes is important, but don't do this on an ad hoc basis. And finally, the, the preferred way of dealing with SQL injection attacks in particular is through the notion of prepared statements. So a prepared statements represents the idea that the SQL the SQL command that needs to run is a statement that is constructed 
at runtime based on user input. The user provides input and the SQL query is constructed out of pieces known ahead of time, such as select star from users, and pieces provided at runtime, such as the user's name. Now, a prepared statement is one that simply constructs a scaffold of a statement with specific places where user-provided input should go. And instead, the user, so the user-provided input is then positioned into these places and the guarantee of the prepared statement is that it will not be interpreted as code. The proper escaping will be then done. Because the problem by simply concatenating strings together to perform queries on the database means that user-provided input, input given at runtime has the same importance level as back-end code written by trusted engineers ahead of time. Right? Both strings are going to be equal components to the resulting query if you just simply concatenate them. If you concatenate these strings, then the level of importance they have is equal. However, they should not be equal. User-provided input should only be data. It should never be considered code. And therefore, prepared statements is the concept that recognizes that, that puts placeholders for user-provided input to be only seen as data and uh, in within a scaffold of code written ahead of time by the trusted engineers. So it has an idea that you bind variables, you put in these variables, the placeholders are then guaranteed to be data that are put into these, these variables, and the SQL statement itself is already written ahead of time, and at runtime these sort of variables are fit in. So you could imagine a, an example like this with a pseudo syntax. We have a string query equals select star from table where user ID equals variable one or question mark in this case. And then a prepared statement is created where you can set an int. So you say something like ps.setInt position one, put the current user ID. So that puts whatever the return from get current user ID is, whatever value that is provided, which may be hostile user input, it sets it as an int into position one. So the result is it's guaranteed to be an int. Whatever gets put in the user ID equals something will just be an int, it will not be code, and then you can safely execute the query.